Okay. 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 All right, everybody. Welcome to uh, Edible Landscapes class this evening, presented by uh, Goodyear Water Conservation. So our presenter today is uh, Jonathan Manning, certified arborist and our wonderful local plant expert. So um, he will be presenting um, the uh, material today. I have a screen up here that's just a quick summary of our programs that we have, some of the programs that we have through um, Goodyear Water Conservation. So I just wanted to go over those um, really quickly for um, those of you who are Goodyear Water customers. Um, if you live in an HOA, we work with HOAs to um, provide them with information about landscape uh, water needs. Um, so it can match the landscape water needs with the actual um, use. So if you are involved with your HOA um, or you're not sure if your HOA is already uh, doing this, I would definitely encourage you to reach out uh, to them and let them know that we have some good information for them to share with them. Um, also, you can see a couple of those things that are available to you as a resident. Um, you can get a free rain sensor. Uh, rain sensor goes attached to your irrigation controller and shuts off automatically when uh, rain hits it. Uh, so that's really useful ahead of the uh, winter time, especially. Um, and then it will automatically, once it dries up, it'll allow the timer to run again. So you don't have to worry about going back and turning your timer on and off. Um, you're eligible for free home irrigation checks if you're a Goodyear Water customer. Uh, we kind of go through your system, help you figure out how, uh, if anything's going on and the best uh, way to water. And then also um, there's a the Flume, which is a, um, a smart home water device. So that uh, uses an app to kind of give you really fine uh, granular data about your water use and help with uh, send some alerts if there's a potential leak. So with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing and turn my screen over to Jonathan here. Oh, you should have access already. So go ahead and share when you're ready. And yeah, take it away. Thank you, Andrew. And welcome everybody. I'm gonna go through uh, my PowerPoint, but it, you can either put questions in the chat and we'll go over them at the end, but I think it's a small enough crowd where we can uh, like unmute mics at the end too and ask, ask questions that way. Either way, but I want there to be lots of time for questions to get to exactly what you came to find out. Uh, my experience comes from just lots of years. I've been um, growing edible plants, which is my favorite. I figure if I'm going to put the time and effort into uh, growing something, water, time, you know, fertilizer, pruning, all that, that it might as well be something that I can get something back from edible. And so it makes me feel uh, better about using the resources on that plant. If it's giving me something back that now I don't have to buy at the grocery store and many things that you grow yourself, uh, you cannot, I don't care how much money you have, you can't buy, for example, a fig like you can when you pick it right off your own tree at the perfect time when it's ripe and not even farmers markets anywhere, you can't find figs that good uh, as if you just grew them yourself. So there's a lot of reasons to grow food in your yard um, for you know, environmental, environmentally friendly to uh, just having the best kind of produce you can get. And uh, I have tried, I've lived in the Southwest desert, Sonoran desert my whole life. And I've pretty much tried everything I've ever heard of that might grow well here. So I've had, lots of failures and I've had lots of successes and that's where my experience is going to come from. I'm going to tell you a little about, you know, some specific plants that I've had luck with as uh, edible landscape plants real briefly on like some tips to culture, like how to grow any kind of plant watering and planting mostly. And then we'll, and like I say, I want to have lots of time for questions. So let's jump into it. Here's the start of the PowerPoint. I will share screens here. That one, put it on slideshow from the beginning. Get the menu bar out of my way. All right, so uh, Edible Landscape, I am a certified arborist, helps a little with what I do with Edible Landscape, but um, it, a, lot of, a lot of fruit trees you trim much differently than you do shade trees. So. As an arborist, I um, have to adapt in that way that not all trees are, are pruned like shade trees are. And um, so most fruit trees honestly aren't trimmed, aren't pruned very much at all, especially citrus. So let's get into, here's the rest of my resume. <laughs> uh, I, I start back then, as far as, uh, that was my grandpa's yard. 
in San Diego and helping him he has a fig tree right behind him and citrus and even cherimoyas and things like that. So fruit was always his favorite thing to grow too, you know, and uh, learned a lot from the start and continued on here in the desert with the rest of it. Here's before you dig. So what I like to advise people is, you know, I've seen uh, uh, so many people, they go to the nursery and they buy 20 fruit trees, all different kinds of tropical, uh, temperate, all different kinds of trees that need all different kinds of microclimates. And they put them in their yard in a, on a grid, you know, every 10 feet, like a checkerboard across their full sun backyard, for example. And most of them fail. And so one thing you got to remember is even in any kind of yard, there's already some places that would have shade in the afternoon or on a real hard freeze in the winter, it's gonna get colder in that part of your yard or warmer uh, in another part of your yard. And especially with tropicals, for, uh, frost is the biggest danger you have with those. And for uh, fruit trees and plants from temperate climates, that's colder climates, you know, um, those, uh, they need shade in the afternoon, almost all of them. And you'd find that like on the east side of your house or on the east side of some bigger trees. So you have to look around the yard kind of and figure out where it's colder, where it's warmer. Where's the water going? It rains. How about that? The, the root, your roof's going to dump it somewhere. If you have gutters, all the better. You can focus that water into barrels or just into a one area where you can plant things that would really appreciate that water. Not just more water. It doesn't rain that often here, but when it does, any water, any rainwater that you can save is not just gallons of water, same as you would get out of the tap. It's been way better water than you could ever buy. Um, it's like buying RO filtered water, like bottled drinking water. And that, that is the best for plants because our soil is salty here and um, it builds, can, it, as you water it, you know, the salt stays behind and the pure water evaporates away and that soil can get saltier and saltier and saltier. And that can become toxic to some uh, plants, especially tropical plants. So maybe you have a guava tree or a mango. Those would be things that would definitely not like salt whatsoever. And that rainwater can help wash away that salt and give those plants, those tropical plants, especially some really good pure water that you um, couldn't get anywhere else, basically. So pay attention to where that water goes and maybe use that spot or do a little grading so it stays in your yard. That's a good thing, too. You know, all that rainwater that just goes straight down the driveway into the gutter is not only a problem for the neighborhood as far as drainage goes sometimes, but it's also a loss of a good asset. So think about all that. Maybe do some grading so it stays in your yard somewhere and plant things that would appreciate that water there. Uh, with full sun, shade, there's places like that already in your yard. In the next couple of slides, we'll talk about how to make more of that. And where I can put some nurse trees, we call them, like trees that are real hardy and grow real fast that could provide a microclimate for those other things that aren't so hardy that might need some shade or frost protection. So let's talk about that, how you could um, create these microclimates if you don't have many already in your yard. So this is the piece of property that I live on now. When I, I bought it in 2001, by 2006 here, I've just put a few, there's a Palo Verde, a Mesquite, a uh, Mulberry, which are very hardy trees here too, full sun, a uh, fruiting Mulberry, not a fruitless Mulberry. The uh, fruitless Mulberries are banned in all the cities of Maricopa County because of all the pollen they produce. And fruiting Mulberries, the ones that make fruit, are not only great edible landscape plants, but they're also a great, uh, nurse tree you know they grow fast they make shade they live in full sun so I put a few of those in you know and a little bit more time goes by those trees get bigger I start to I prefer a little bit of shade around them a couple pomegranates and figs would they can grow in full sun but they appreciate a little more shade and then finally you know that's that mulberry tree providing enough shade and protection for lots of tender stuff underneath. There's a, that's a, the round barrel is a bay tree, like the bay leaf you put in spaghetti, you know, that kind of thing, herbs. 
uh, mint is growing around the pot underneath it. Both of those things need a little shade to grow. And I didn't have any shade to put them in when I first started. So as time goes on, this is just, you might not need as much time, but it's just an example of how you can, uh, if, you, if you're starting off like a lot of people with a bare backyard, not one thing anywhere, and all your neighbor's trees are only four feet tall too, um, you might start with a couple trees. And the next slide is uh, tips on what you would do. So first we talk about uh, look around the yard, maybe start with a few things that are hardy to get some shade going, some frost protection. And here's some tips on planting and care. And I, because these are whole different classes, you know, I could talk on and on about how to take care of plants in general, how to irrigate them, how to prune them, all these things. We, there is different classes on, which you can find on, um, uh, they're recorded for, by City of Goodyear. You find them on YouTube. There's a link to them on the same page that you registered for this class on. So um, you can find what, much more information on this there, but I have over the years, you know, just trying to help anybody that wants help as far as keeping their um, plants alive and healthy here in the desert. I've found two things mainly that are key. And the first one is that transplant. When you bring home that plant, especially citrus, um, you try to grab the trunk and tap the pot off gently and boom, all the dirt falls off taking the roots with it. So the root ball, the all the roots that tree have just got ripped off and they're in a pile on the ground or back in the pot where you're holding the trunk in your hand, you know? And um, and that is a death sentence. It's They might recover. They, they may recover. The first thing they wilt. Very next day they're wilted. They wilt for a long time. Maybe the leaves fall off. Then the sun comes in because there's no leaves and maybe burns all the skin of the trunk and branches. It's just a spiral downward. And um, it could have all been avoided by being very careful with that root ball when you plant anything. All these trees we talk about, I would never try to pull the plant upwards out of the pot. You're always going to want to uh, lay the pot next to the hole. You dig the hole just as deep as the pot is, just as deep as the soil is, because really you want it to be level with the ground when it goes in. The width is as wide as you're up for. The wider, the better, as far as the width goes. And there's a point where you just don't have the energy to do it, but try to make the hole as wide as you can, but only the depth of the soil. You lay that pot on the side of it. You cut the bottom off the plastic pot. You hold the soil up in there with your hand. You put the whole thing down in the hole with the sides of the pot still on. Then you adjust it a little bit. And the very last thing is that you cut the side of that plastic pot, pull the last of the plastic up out of the hole and backfill with dirt as carefully as possible. If you do not break one root on that plant when you put it in, it's gonna keep growing like it did in the nursery every day, like nothing happened. No transplant shock, um, you know, none of that. Should, none, none of that should have to happen. Uh, it should just keep growing tomorrow like it did today with no, no uh, setback whatsoever. And then you get a healthy plant that starts to establish and root and produce fruit as, as uh, quickly as possible. So that's the first thing I see people do wrong is destroying that root ball, trying to get it out. Some people do it on purpose because they've heard that you need to uh, cut those roots or fluff them up or loosen them up. And all that does damage to roots. The reason you may have heard that is because a plant that's been in a pot for a really long time can be root bound, or it can be, uh, it can have one root that goes all the way around the trunk, all the way up at the surface. Those you can find, so pick your plant well, you know, be, be careful of the plant that you pick. Uh, you can uh, turn it upside down and pull the pot off in the nursery if you don't ruin it there, you know, or dig, the best thing is to dig around where the trunk goes in the soil, dig around it with your fingers a little bit and get some soil off to the sides and make sure those, there's no root wrapped around the trunk right there. It'll be shallow up there if it's a problem. Um, so just pick a good plant that doesn't look like it's been in the pot forever. Another good sign is how high the soil level is. None of us in the nursery industry put the soil halfway down the pot when we plant something fresh. If you find a plant with half a pot of soil, that means it's been sitting around for a year or two in that pot getting root bound. So pick a plant that looks, you know, high soil level, no root wrapped around the trunk and don't touch the roots after that. Put, put it in as carefully as you can. The next thing is watering. The next failure I find is that people 
don't really know what to do with the watering situation and is it too much water is it not enough water i don't know and they end up not watering enough or not watering correctly so that's a whole other class like i say i'll very quickly say the tricks to watering here in the desert uh the basics are you get the whole area under the plant wet when you water as best you can if it's drip irrigation it's a lot of drip emitters if that's what it takes to wet the whole area underneath the plant and remember that plant gets bigger and as it does, you got to wet more area underneath it. Those, that's where the roots are, as big around as the tree at least. And so you wet the whole area on the ground underneath the plant when you, when you water as best you can. Then you water for long enough so that that water soaks in to three feet deep, which can usually take one to three hours around the valley in different soil types. And then you do not do any of that again until the soil surface is dry. That's the three tricks to water in here. I mean, like I say, I could talk for another two hours about it, but that, that is as simple as it gets. You wet the whole area, you run it long enough to soak it in three feet deep, and you don't do it again until the soil surface dries out. Then you won't ever have to worry about overwatering. You won't have to worry about the water being too shallow up in the surface and the, where the roots are down deep, it's not, dry, it's not wet. It fixes all those things. So that's enough fun care. Uh, for this particular purposes, I want to get to all the all the cool stuff we're going to talk about, and you can ask anything you need to in the questions from here. So, the first category I kind of broke these up into categories because different. Uh, I always love to know where a plant's from in the world before I grow it or when I buy it because it tells me everything about how to take care of it. Um, subtropical climate is what we live in, so these plants are very easy here. They don't take a whole lot of frost protection. They don't take a whole lot of shade, you know, it's like I'll mention it if the particular one does, but subtropical is our climate more or less. And so the thing, these things in this category are very adapted to our climate. You get the most bang for your buck, you know, they're plants that don't need a whole lot of babying to grow and produce fruit here very well. Or, um, and then um, we'll go from there. So, so plant that I love to use, it's a native mesquite. And a lot of you might have uh, thornless South American mesquites, thornless hybrid mesquites. If they don't have thorns, they have South American mesquite in them, which is also a good tree. The only difference is native mesquites make a, a pod, which is, I'll leave, as I'm on this slide, just notice how beautiful that you can make these trees. I would always make them a multiple trunk tree. Mesquites, any desert tree for that matter, in my opinion, is much healthier and stronger to the wind and um, grows faster than everything else when it's a multiple trunk tree. They were never ever evolved to be single trunk trees. If you find me one tall single trunk tree out in the desert somewhere, I'll give you some kind of reward because there's none out there. Um, that's the way they're adapted to live and that's the way they do their best and that's the way they serve our function the best as well. So nice multiple trunk tree. Um, you get those branches growing up and out. You can still get it to where you can do lots of work and plant lots of things underneath them that um, even as a multiple trunk tree. And this particular one also produces a food item, which is these bean pods. And that's where I went with the, the, um, the, nat the thornless mesquites also make bean pods. They're just not quite as flavorful and sweet as the native mesquites that do have thorns. So either one works as a good shade plant. So these are these are trees that you could put on the west side of that barren backyard if you had just one or two on most backyards. And I would move them toward the west side. Now, obviously not too close to the brick wall, maybe 10 feet away from the brick wall on the west side of the backyard and one or two there. And within five years, you'll have this really nice shade casting across your whole backyard in the afternoon is when you want the shade for all those other stuff that might need a lot more shade. Um, so it's a very good thing to put in. Uh, you can water them a lot in the beginning and they grow very fast. And then as they get to the size that you need them to be, you can st almost stop watering them altogether. And then um, they'll stay more the size that you want and not have this excess of growth. So native mesquite is a wonderful tree to start with if you don't have anything. And I'll let you find out much more about these pods. They, they, if you just search mesquite pod anything online, there's, a, there's an organization um, in Tucson called Native Harvesters, I believe. I don't have it in front of me, but they, uh, they specialize in products. And uh, some places too, you can find... Uh, 
grinding like festivals, you know, where you can bring a bucket of pods in from your tree and they'll grind them for you into the flour that they, that they um, use. So it, the pods grind up into a really sweet tasting flour. It's good for diabetics because it regulates your blood sugar and it tastes sweet. So it's a nice treat. And um, anyway, like I say, I won't go on anymore about that, but it's a very good edible landscape tree to start with. And um, you can create a microclimate for some of these other things that are not so hardy by planting them out there first. That's, uh, citrus, Oof, that's another thing. I've noticed that people who move here from anywhere that you can't grow citrus, this is the first tree they want to put in. It's the one, you know, they've bought, they've had them their whole life, bought them in a grocery store. And it's that, oh man, I want to grow my own. And finally, you know, so I would say that's terrific because it's a wonderful tree. They're all the varieties are wonderful trees for our climate. They're easy. It takes water and a once or twice a year fertilizer. And that's about it. You don't trim them unless you have to. I mean, um, they would prefer not to be trimmed, you know, as far as the plant health goes. And they're just varieties are endless. So new ones all the time means the universities and and grow big citrus growers, you know, they they hybridize and they find new combinations of citrus. So there's like different, there's the original varieties, you know, lemon, grapefruit, tangerine, orange, uh, lime, and there's hybrids of those. So like a uh, tangelo, for example, is half tangerine, which most people would guess right away. I don't know if most people would think that the other half of a tangelo is grapefruit, but lots of interesting combinations that come out of this and new ones all the time. And it's a wonderful tree to grow here. It's just easy and the most bang for your buck of, of by far. Uh, you'll be given citrus fruit away to neighbors in no time with one of these uh, or sending it back home to relatives. I don't know, whatever. Uh, so this is an example of one of the biggest types of citrus. And I bring this up because citrus tree, citrus varieties, most people pick what they want because of the fruit that they like. You know, I love tangerines. I'm going to buy a tangerine tree. Or I love lemons for this. I love limes for my Corona. So I'm going to buy a lime tree. But this is, you got to also consider that they grow, the trees of each variety get bigger and small. They're different in size, mainly. Two things, size and frost tolerance. So um, size, the biggest ones are, are probably lemons, you know, big yellow lemons, Lisbon lemon, lemon, things like that. They're, they're the biggest trees and you could almost get a shade tree out of it like this picture shows. Um, they get big enough where you could make shade under them. Uh, it would take a while and I wouldn't try to trim them up too high too quick because the sun can get in there and burn the trunks. But little by little, you let them grow. And this lemon, a full-size lemon, is capable of making some shade. On the other end of the scale is this tangerine tree that's 10 years old and still uh, still only about 8 by 8 feet. Real dense, makes lots of fruit, but the tree is very, very small. And honestly, these are, these are 20 years old now. And they're still only about 10 by 10, maybe 12 by 12. So I'm never getting shade out of them. That's for sure. There's never going to be a picnic table underneath them. Uh, but they produce tons of fruit. And that's really the way that citrus are healthiest is with the branches all the way to the ground like that. So this is, I'm telling you all this, so you can consider these things before you buy a citrus tree and remember where the spot where you want to put that citrus tree, make sure that it's big enough for the variety that you're going to buy. Grapefruits and lemons are very big trees. So if you have a little tiny corner of your backyard that's only five by five or, or so, I, it's going to be a challenge to keep a lemon or a grapefruit in that space. You could buy a dwarf lemon or grapefruit. That might help. It keeps them about half of their natural size then. And um, that could help. Or you could go with one of the varieties that's already small like that, like a Mexican lime or a tangerine or a kumquat. So think about the size they are, the, the mature size of the tree, the kind of fruit that you like and you think you're going to use. And um, that frost tolerance consideration is only um, valid if you live in outlying areas. So I'll start here. Uh, the frost situation is much more critical when we get into tropical trees, but the frost is is like um, in the in town now downtown it rarely ever freezes anymore. We've had about three years without 
any frost really. So, but I remember years before that, they were very cold in the outlying areas. It can get down to 15, 16 degrees and that would kill some citrus trees. So look up that too. I won't get into every variety and how hardy they are, but there is some that are very sensitive to cold that you would only want to grow if you lived kind of surrounded by city. And then there's other ones that are very hardy. I, I get colder where I am. Um, there's fields around and it's an outlying area and it does get down to that 15, 16 in rare record years of cold. And I have lost uh, Lisbon lemons. I've lost Mexican limes, but I've had tangerines in the same situation and they just do great. So they vary in tolerance. So if you do live in outlying areas, maybe watch that a little bit. If you live for in town where you're kind of surrounded by city, um, then you wouldn't have to worry about it as much. So that's it. Citru enjoy citrus. There's a wonderful addition to any yard around here and um, utilize them for, for the things that you can get out of them, whether it be shade out of that lemon or just tons of fruit off of any of them. So that's citrus. Figs and, figs and pomegranates were brought by Spanish missionaries to this region because they found them in the Middle East very similar climate, assumed they would grow well here, and they were right. They grow wonderfully here. They're from a climate just like ours. They do require irrigation. There's not, these aren't like that mesquite that you could like leave without water someday. But if you water enough and fertilize, you can get them to be very productive and very beautiful plants here. So figs, um, there's a million varieties of figs. Uh, I, if you're just starting out and want to try any fig, I would go with Black Mission. These are a little bit smaller figs, which turns some people, when they're looking through all the descriptions, they might go for a bigger fig. But remember, if you've ever had a straw, a huge strawberry and they're hollow in the middle, that's the way figs are. If it's big, it means they're hollow in the middle. And the little hole in the end of the fig opens up and bugs and fungus like mold gets up in there. So in my opinion, Black Mission is the best fig for our region. The hole in the end stays shut. They're a little bit smaller. They're very, very, very juicy inside. And the whole inside is like flesh, like good fruit. And they don't tend to get bugs and mold in them because that eye in the end stays shut. That's what I like about Black Mission. They also reliably produce figs every June. They, instead of other ones, they I've had other varieties that try to make fruit really late, almost into the frost, or they try to make them really early before they can uh, develop all the way. So I don't know. I've just had problems with other varieties of figs ripening well and making a good crop. And Black Mission have never failed to make a, a really good crop, really good um, once a year in, in about June usually. So uh, that's figs. Pindo palm, there's a lot of these. So I'm gonna go quickly through them. Pindo palm is what you would call these around here. Most nurseries carry them. They're not often in the fruit section, they're usually in the palm section, but they do produce fruit. There's a little one. The leaf you can see here is kind of recurve. It curls around a little bit, pretty palm. Very slow growing, doesn't need much room. If you have that little tiny corner of your backyard, these would be fine. It's a very small, slow growing palm. And then you get these, the big old like racks of fruit. It does take a long time for them to start fruiting. They're all grown from seed. So usually if you buy a small one, it's immature still, and it needs years to get mature until it starts to bloom. But as opposed to date palms where you need two, two male and female to cross pollinate to make fruit, these do make fruit all by themselves. One palm will make fruit uh, um, all by itself if they're old enough. And that's the inside of the fruit. They're about quarter size. I don't know what kind of money that is. It's an internet, internet photo, but they're about quarter size with that seed in the middle, but all that yellow flesh around the outside um, is very, very good, almost pineapple tasting. Good, good edible landscape plant. So jujubes uh, is very also hardy here. It's, remember, we're, all these plants we're talking about are pretty much bulletproof in our climate. And um, jujubes are uh, very productive. I get twice a year, I get a bunch of fruit off these. There's the fruit, they're like little apples. Uh, you can eat them when they first start to get a little bit of brown on them like that. I would say the biggest varieties, which is Lee is the name of the biggest variety I've had. Lee maybe get like the size of a ping pong ball. And then other varieties are a little smaller than that. Um, they're very tasty. They dry and can be stored forever. So if you let them turn all the way brown and dry them, they, you can store them forever and you can rehydrate them 
in a pot of boiling water and then make syrup out of the fruit. I mean, the, the uses are the hard part on this one. The, it tastes honestly like kind of like a dry apple, like a, like the best styrofoam you've ever had. <laughs> They're sweet. It's just the texture is a little weird for most people to eat if you're expecting this apple type fruit. But but they're very, very productive. And it's a very good uh, asset to an edible landscape, you know, something that's out there producing lots and lots of edible fruit and doesn't take hardly any care whatsoever. They're also deciduous. That means they lose their leaves in the winter. So you could put them in front of maybe a west facing window and you get that shade in the summer when it's hot and then the leaves fall off for the winter and you get the sun coming in when you want some sun in your house. So it could be work for that too. They don't get very big, maybe 15, 20 feet is a big one. So you could put them a little closer to the house without worrying about roots that get so big they lift your foundation or things like that. So um, mulberries, uh, this is one I've tried every kind of fruit I could find in my yard and try, honestly, I have three acres. So I've always tried to find something that could become a commercial crop, a new commercial crop around here. And this one is actually, I've sold fruit from it for about 10 years now. And it's very, popular, you know, sells like crazy. And the trees are just very, very productive. This variety, not all varieties of mulberry are the same though. You may have had varieties in other climates, wild mulberries, mulberries that sprouted on their own in somebody's yard and ended up making fruit. The fruit quality is very, very, very different. This variety is called Pakistan and they're very large. Uh, they don't stain when you touch them. They have some really good flavor, like some acid to them. Not Some mulberries, are they're all sweet, but some are just sweet with no flavor. And this one has a ton of flavor. It's just a really good variety. There's a couple other ones that I've had that I also love, other varieties of fruity mulberry. But if you're going to do this, get, get varieties of mulberry. Find them that are um, not just seedlings that came up somewhere in somebody's yard from a bird putting them there. You, you find varieties that are labeled as a fruit tree, sold as a fruit tree. And these varieties were developed in the Middle East for thousands and thousands of years to have better fruit and better fruit and better fruit like we do with apples here. So there's a difference between like wild mulberries and like ones that have been developed as a fruit tree. But if you do, um, it is a wonderfully productive tree in our climate. And it's another one that you can use as uh, cast in a little shade in the afternoon across the yard and also a fruit bearing plant. So uh, let's see here. They do make a little mess. So the reason people stopped using them a long time ago as a shade tree is because when all you want is a shade tree, all this fruit falls on the ground. If you're not picking the fruit, it all falls on the ground. You step on it, you can traipse it through the house, things like that. Um, a lot of people have a home flock of chickens now. That's the solution to that problem. I mean, everyone that hits the ground, chickens eat. So I don't know if you're into that kind of thing, but it kind of goes with edible landscape. If you got a couple of hens in the backyard that uh, these days more and more people are doing, that solves that fruit problem right there. And that's just the ones that you don't pick yourself. And what I would do is trim this tree as I do these uh, and keep them very short. You cut off all the growth that grows straight up because normally they would be a 40, 50 foot tall tree. So I chop them back every winter when they're dormant to keep them nice and short for hand picking. So that's enough about that one, but it's a very, very good fruit tree that's very underused. And a lot of people, as I mentioned in the beginning, think that all mulberries are banned in our cities here in Maricopa County, but all the ordinances are written up as, uh, fruitless mulberries. That's male mulberries. That's the ones that do not produce fruit. What they do is produce a ton of pollen. And that pollen is irritating to uh, not even just people with allergies. It's irritating to everybody's eyes. But fruiting trees do not make pollen. So it's a whole different, whole different thing. And let's see here. Pomegranates, the other type introduction you know they're wonderful big bushes I, it's another one that i would never try to make into a lollipop shaped tree i've seen people do it and you fight the suckers coming back forever and the tree ends up failing from that sun any trunk uh, it's hard to do other than just this big bush but as a big bush once you wrap your brain around that um, they work they make a wonderful hedgerow a lot of people are looking to block a neighbor's view two story next door or something like that. And these things will get maybe 10 up to 15 feet tall, real thick and um, 
leafy in the summer they do lose their leaves in the winter but even when they lose their leaves all the little sticks kind of make a pretty good visual barrier through the winter also so works good like that or you can just have one tree um this is the flower that they get in the spring is beautiful they come out with the leaves in the spring with beautiful flowers all over them even that is a is a asset fall color that's a whole hedgerow of them i have here to kind of divide one area from the other block the view um, of neighbors there too so in the fall beautiful fall color and then um and then the harvest and the reason is yeah let me get back to that 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 picture is to remind me that out of all those fruit that year about half of them were like not good inside so they look beautiful but you crack them open and they're either yellow or black and I won't get into all the detail. I do a whole class on this kind of thing. So it, it is, uh, or you can ask questions or email me, but they, uh, they have trouble. Pomegranates have a little trouble not growing here. They grow wonderfully with enough water. Um, what they have trouble here was with really good fruit quality. So if you have a baby tree, I would not expect it to make pretty good fruit until it gets older. The more strongly, uh, the more, established they get and the deeper rooted they get the better the fruit gets so if nothing else just have patience and they really need a regular irrigation cycle all summer long like you can't skip a week i would say once a week deep soak all summer long while they're developing their fruit the problem is that fruit that bloom in the spring in say march and the baby fruit has to survive june july august september and then they get ripe in like october so that's a long rough ride to be trying to ripen during that time. And if our heat gets too extreme, it'll cook them in the middle. And even though they look good on the inside, they're um, they're not good on the, I mean, even though they look good on the outside, they're not good on the inside. Another thing is if you, if you mess up that regular cycle of water, say you go two, three weeks without watering them, the skin on those fruit dries out and then you remember to water them and the water comes back and the inside of the fruit starts growing again, well, then they crack open. So if you have like all of them are cracked open, that's usually because the watering cycle was not very regular um, and they dried out a little bit somewhere in those four months of developing. So it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge to get really, really good, perfect fruit, but it's still no reason not to grow them. They're wonderful trees for all those other reasons. And you always get a few fruit anyway. And sometimes some years, a lot of good fruit. And the older the tree gets, remember, the more good fruit you'll get. So uh, talk about a uh, desert adapted fruiting plant. This is these kind of prickly pear uh, are not wild plants. These plants had been developed by people in Mesoamerica, south of here, you know, what's now Mexico and Central America. Uh, they were developed like corn was from this wild cactus that made fruit that was eh, to uh, to something that makes really, really good fruit and also a vegetable product we'll talk about here. But so so even nowadays, universities in Mexico produce new varieties all the time. If you go to a food city in town, you can find these beautiful like uh, prickly pear fruit that are magenta colored in the middle and really, really sweet. Uh, they do have big seeds in them like a guava, but I don't mind. <laughs> they, they taste so good. I, I love them and would deal with the big seeds, you know. So um, they, it's a very useful plant. Uh, it's on the Mexican flag. It's so useful. <laughs> it's what the eagle's standing on. Um, it's, a, it's definitely a valued plant in just south of here, and it's working its way up. You know, it's, it, this, we live in the same desert, same Sonoran desert, and it's a very wonderful um, very productive plant that I water. I, that's the front of my house there. And I water that row of cactus maybe twice a year, a year. So um, talk about water uh, conservation. And, and I get maybe 80 pounds of fruit off of the same row of cactus. And anytime I want, I can find the, the pads that are uh, the vegetable portion. Do I have? Yeah. So the pad there, the brand new pads when they're babies is called nopales or nopalitos. When you trim all those little black dots off and you can chop anyway, I'll go, you can look that up, Google, you know, search nopales and you'll find every recipe recipe ever invented on the, that's the vegetable portion. Very, very nutritious. Also good for diabetics because um, it regulates blood sugar, lots of minerals and vitamins in it. And then the fruit. So the fruit, this is one type of fruit 
but the varieties of fruit are endless. There's, there's yellow, orange, red, magenta, and then new varieties all the time that are sweeter and better, more productive, bigger, whatever. So um, this is just the kind that comes off of that row that I have myself, but I've collected over the years, kind of every new one that I could find with a different kind of fruit, all wonderful and all uh, very uh, efficient producers of food in our edible landscapes here in Phoenix. So try it out. Um, if you want the vegetable portion, if you do know what Nopales are and you want to have lots of them, I would trim these a lot. Don't let them get too big. You trim a pad off and three more come back. You trim those off and five more come back. You know, the more you trim, the more of this you get. If on the other hand, you want this fruit, I would not trim ever. Uh, every time I trim, the next year they spend making new, they recover by putting new leaves out, new pads out, and they skip fruiting very well that year. So if you want fruit, you hardly ever trim. And if you want uh, nopales, you trim all the time. So that's a little trick about those that if you want both, buy two plants. <laughs> and if you, a lot of times in nurseries, this one's not labeled as what kind of fruit you get. And honestly, it takes a couple of years for them to produce fruit sometimes. So if you're interested in a certain kind of fruit, then uh, you have to really, you, you can get a cutting from somebody you know that has one that produces a good kind of fruit. You could um, email me. And I know that's the second time I've told you that without giving you my email. So uh, Andrew, if you could remind me to either put that in the chat or, or something where they could get a hold of me, I would always be happy to answer questions over email. So in the questions part, we'll have to get to that. But um, next one, they're very cold tolerant here. They're just not heat tolerant at all. So uh, shade all day, shade in the afternoon, if nothing else. What I did with this one in my yard is put a, there's that Palo Verde tree on the west side of it. So all afternoon it gets shaded by that Palo Verde tree. It did well in that circumstance, but you have to give them some shade. But I've seen many loquats in Phoenix with lots and lots of fruit on them. And I love the fruit. Does that have a picture? There's flowers. The flowers smell really, really pretty. And they're in the winter time when you want to be out in the yard working around them too. So it's a good time to have all these flowers on them. Then late winter, they start making fruit. And there's the fruit. They look like an apricot, but don't taste anything like an apricot. It tastes very tropical fruity. I don't know. Uh, you'd have to try one, but they're very common in Southern California, all the way up to San Francisco, even on the coast. There's tons of them. And, um, you know, it's a really good fruit that's underutilized. I think because a lot of people buy them, I even see them for sale a lot now, even at uh, box stores, you know, and nurseries. But I think a lot of people put them out in the full sun and they die. So just remember shade, much shade really is underneath some other kind of tree. The best ones I have going right now are under the canopy of a big mesquite tree. And I just keep them trimmed kind of short so they fit in that situation, but they're doing wonderful there. So the filtered sunlight that goes through that mesquite is perfect, but uh, try one, Those, they're wonderful. Um, you can buy fruit sometimes in like Asian markets if you wanna try the fruit first, but okay. Pineapple guava, same thing as the loquat. Don't mind the cold at all, like tropical fruit does. Being a guava, you would think it's a tropical fruit, but these handle cold very well, as much cold as we get in Phoenix, but they do not handle full sun here. So same thing, everything I just said about loquats, same thing for these. These take a while to fruit. They uh, take, I would say, if you, they're really healthy, it'd still take four or five years to start making fruit. But once they do, they're amazing. I love, they smell really good, really sweet. And it's a really good one to grow. And there's the flowers, beautiful. You do get flowers right away. The first year or two, you'll get flowers. And the flowers are edible also. Um, I have seen those flowers on the top of cupcakes or a cake. And not only beautiful, but the petals are really, really sweet. So you can start using those right away. But the fruit comes later. Uh, here's another cactus that's very... Uh, well, it, it makes fruit. How about that? So it's Cirrus Pruviana, Peruvian apple. They do make fruit. The fruit is a little haphazard though because it requires cross-pollination. So two varieties bloom in the same night. A moth grows from one to the other. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get fruit. Some people get tons of fruit and they, I, don't, I don't know if they know why or not, but 
it's a little, like I say, you could work this out. If you're really interested, look into it, email me, whatever. And I will explain the, the details of how to get fruit off of them. But even if you don't, having one of these in the yard, how beautiful is that? You know, those flowers open at night, but they're still open for the first couple hours of the morning. So if you get out, you know, early morning in the summertime, there's all these flowers on them, beautiful white flower, big white flowers. And there's the fruit. The fruit is, do I have a, uh, the fruit in the inside has seeds like a kiwi, so they're nice. They're, they're not hard and crunchy like, like the prickly pear fruit seeds are. The seeds are very edible, like a kiwi seed. And the flesh is a lot like a dragon fruit. It's actually related to dragon fruit. If you've tried a dragon fruit now in the store, um, about the same thing, that spongy kind of flesh with the little black seeds and not a ton of flavor, but they're sweet. Uh, and something worth, you know, putting out there. If you're sticking with edible plants out there in the yard, you want another cactus that's very adapted to our climate, low water use, there's another one for you. All cactus on that, on that note make some kind of edible fruit. Some are very dry, some don't taste very good, but they all make uh, some type of fruit. So cactus is for that matter, you can keep gather. There's hedgehog cactus that make a really good little fruit. There's all cactus, like I say, really make some kind of fruit that uh, might not be the, the best fruit out there, but they're edible. So they fit into the edible category. And some are very, very good. So tropical fruit, I got this thing going. Uh, I'm gonna try to finish up by seven for questions. So tropical fruit, the, the key here is frost protection. There's a reason they only live in the tropics and it's frost. So the further they get out of the tropics, they're, they die from the cold in the winter, if, especially if they're wild and trying to grow from seed and that cold snap comes in the winter and they're not adapted to, they have no defenses against cold. Um, that's why they're stuck in the tropics, but they, um, they usually handle our heat pretty well. Um, that's one good thing about them, but it's that frost protection that they really need. So here's a few tips on frost protection. Up against the house, is a very good spot for these things. And none of a lot of them don't get to be very big trees. So you don't have to worry about putting them real close to the house like they would not lift your foundation. Uh, even palm trees, they call them trees, but it's really a giant bush. Even two feet away from the slab, I don't suspect they would ever cause any kind of trouble to the foundation. So um, you can tuck those things up against the house underneath the eave a little bit or um, in a really big pot under the porch, even better, or under a tree. Even trees that lose some of their leaves in the winter, like a mesquite, still provide some kind of frost protection uh, overhead. So you're really looking for something over the top or the heat of your own house. None of us like to think about it, but your house is like bleeding heat all night long, whether you like it or not. Some houses more than others, but even the best insulated houses uh, still put out a little bit of heat in the nighttime on those coldest winters. You can also put Christmas lights. It's hard to find old fashioned Christmas lights that get hot though. <laughs> Nowadays, they're almost all LED and LED lights do not work the same. They don't make any heat and it doesn't keep your plants warm through the winter. So you're looking for old fashioned incandescent Christmas lights. But if you do wrap a frost sensitive tree in those, that helps a lot too. Um, it last, you know, the most amount of effort you could put into it is some kind of structure, whether it be just two pieces of PVC pipe that make like an igloo and then a piece of sheet of plastic thrown over that. Uh, you need the structure because plastic can't touch the leaves. You need to have some kind of wood, plastic, pipe, something to hold the plastic uh, uh, off of the leaves. Maybe some bricks on the corners to hold it down so the wind doesn't blow it away. But that will protect plants much, much, much better than frost blanket, which a lot of people, I don't have a lot of faith in frost blanket. It helps a little. That's the best I can say about it. Frost blanket, if something was going to die at 30 degrees, you, if you cover it with the best frost blanket I've ever found, it could get down to maybe 25 degrees. And after that, it's still going to die. So it's not a full, everybody thinks, well, I'll just cover it with frost blanket. Well, it helps, but it's not, you know, a miracle. So all those other methods are honestly a lot better ways to frost protect your plants, but anything you can do for these would help in the winter time. So let's go through, a few. I just got a few. In here. Um, Mexican papaya, it'll grow in full sun here, giant leaves, kind of looks like a palm tree. And I've seen many produce fruit here 
and they grow super fast. I, it's almost like a giant annual or something, you know, uh, it is, um, fast growing, but frost sensitive, like the rest, a full sun's fine. This was, this was in full sun and it got to be like 118 that year and it went right through it. No problem at all. So papaya is a good one. I only have a couple in here because, um, they're, uh, harder to find and you can, you'll have to look up more information, but pineapple, I just threw it in here cause it's a fun one. <laughs> you can rip the top off a of pineapple at the store if it's still real healthy and vigorous and rip the leaves off the bottom, let it dry out for a day or two, and then put it in a nice pot with potting soil and they root out into it and grow into another plant. It makes a nice like house plant in a really bright window or out on the porch in a pot. The growth is a lot like an agave, honestly, um, but it is a tropical plant. It needs frost protection and this one needs a little shade. So um, as far as tropicals go, I'm going to list a few other ones that I've seen do really good in town. And at, just out of time here, I'm going to skip some. I'm going to not, I don't have photos of them. So um, mangoes do very well here if they're frost protected. Uh, guavas, same thing. Um, bananas even if they don't freeze in the winter it takes about two years but they'll produce bananas here almost all the varieties so those are the three big ones I see all over town in people's yards that protect them from the frost and they produce well here um, I, I don't have a, any faith in avocados here I've tried myself many times I've seen other people try I've heard people say that they had luck but I've yet to see proof but um, avocados are very, very challenging here. They burn in the summer heat. They freeze in the winter frost. They, uh, they bloom during a time of year when our humidity is very low and that kills the pollen a lot of times. So they can't make fruit that way. The challenges are endless. So, I mean, there's so many other options of wonderful tropical fruit that you could grow. Um, there's also, if you really want to uh, learn more, there's a rare fruit growers society, like a club here in town look them up and go to a meeting or two and you'll um, you can join, you can go to all the meetings. You, they have get togethers where they share like cuttings back and forth or baby plants. They have a plant sale uh, once, at least once a year. And um, it'd be a good way to learn a whole lot about uh, tropical fruit. Cause that's mainly what all of them uh, are into around here. There's a couple of nurseries in town that specialize in tropical fruit. Look those up. And even if you go to their yard, you'll kind of see, um, the stuff they have growing in the ground and they can tell you all about it. So there is lots of tropicals that grow well here, but um, the frost protection is what they, what they all would need. And let's see here. That's a pineapple with a little flower coming out. And uh, at that point that comes out into a new pineapple and you start the whole process over again. Um, let's see, cold climate. The other one that a lot of people are familiar with it moved here from colder parts of the United States. And that's where, honestly, a lot of people do move here from. It's our, our mild climate is attractive to people who come from colder climates. So they come here with good memories of having good fruit in cold climates, apple, peaches, things that are honestly very challenging to grow here because of our heat. So obviously these things handle the cold. Not only do they handle the cold we get here in Phoenix, they need more cold than we get in a lot of cases. So chill hours is what you're looking for. If you find a variety of any of these fruits in the store, you're gonna wanna search the name like Anna Apple Chill Hours like that. So it'll tell you maybe 300 hours. Okay, that's okay here then. You, what you're looking for is 300 or less chill hours on these kind of fruit and then you, usually we'll get fruit here. Um, but it's very, very common that um, you buy a variety that needs four or 500 or more chill hours in the winter, and it'll never produce fruit. It'll grow, possibly it'll grow okay here with some shade in the afternoon. That helps all these trees a lot to have shade in the afternoon because they do not like our heat. And our very warm winters oftentimes uh, don't let them produce fruit if their chill hours are very high above 300, I would say. So apples grow good here. Anna is a very good variety for our climate. This is a good example of, so this apple on the right is underneath that mesquite tree just a little bit, and the one on the left is not. See the yellow trunk on the one on the left? as sunburn. And a lot of varieties of apple, or all these trees really, if, they're, it's, if it's a variety that wants to get long and skinny and whippy, you want to cut it back to make it short and bushy. 
So if that was shorter, bushier, and had leaves to protect its own trunk, it would be more like the one on the right. Or you put them with some afternoon shade, and then they, you know, that helps the problem too. But sunburn on the trunks when they get too tall and skinny is a very big problem in these kind of trees. Apples have beautiful flowers, sometimes at weird times of the year. I've seen them bloom in the middle of winter, um, but mainly in the spring is the flowers that make fruit. Little baby apples, bigger apples. All the varieties of apples that I've had luck with in Phoenix are yellow. I don't know why. There's Anna, Ein Shamir, um, Golden Dorset. They all have yellow apples for some reason, and uh, they're good, but they're like a golden delicious more type apple. They're the ones that seem to be more adapted to our climate. Uh, Desert Delight Nectarine, I had one for many years. Um, that's another thing about a lot of these trees is they can produce fruit for a good 10 years. And sometimes that's about as long as their lifespan is because the heat beats them up every summer so bad. They come back with fruit every spring, but it shortens their life a little bit just to deal with our heat here. Um, but you still, 10 years of fruit, why not? And this is an example of thrip damage on a nectarine. So nectarines I love because they don't have a fuzz on them like a peach. Uh, so I bought a nectarine, right? Why wouldn't you if you like the fruit better? Well, one reason why not too is because thrips made every fruit that nectarine made like that and it turns into a scabby gross fruit and I don't spray poison on the property so I ended up leaving them like that when I found bonanza peaches and now I know what the fuzz is for on a peach it's to keep the bugs off of them as they're developing so changed my mind I like peaches much better than nectarines now now that I'm trying to grow my own you know uh, it makes a big difference than the, this is the case in a lot of fruit a lot of things that I, if I was to buy it in the store, I might say, mm, I don't know, it's a little weird or I'm not sure I like that. But when you're trying to grow your own food, it, sometimes it can change your mind if something just really, really produces well, really good quality fruit and something side by side just fails every time. I mean, you tend to lean toward the ones that you can do well with. And Bonanza Peach is the, if you want something out of this whole category of cold climate fruits here in Phoenix, I would start with the Bonanza Peach. Beautiful little trees, dwarf trees. The, the foliage is real dense, so it protects the fruit from birds seeing it and also from sun damage, which is our big damage here, heat and sun. So big peaches every year, no matter how mild the winter is. And so Bonanza Peach, I would pick that one out of this whole category. Uh, if you want to start or even just have one tree in the yard, they don't take up much room either. It's a very small tree. And let's see. Santa Rosa plum, I've had, I have plum trees and they produce a lot. Santa Rosa is a good variety for here. I only have one variety and they do produce fruit pretty good still being a Santa Rosa plum. They, it turns yellow like that though. And I wanted to put this photo in there to show you a lot of these kind of fruits and even citrus can turn yellow like this. So it's a lack of iron. Well, there's lots of iron in our soil, um, but our soil pH is so high that these types of trees that are not adapted to desert soil, they have trouble pulling the iron out of our soil with the pH so high. If that's all too technical for you, you buy you could buy liquid iron and spray it on them. You can buy grain like a powdered iron and put it on the ground. You can you find a, a lot of all nurseries have a section with like iron supplement. And if it's made for to do that, it, then it uh, fixes this problem. Another thing you can do if you're tired, if you do that every year, twice a year, maybe to get your trees back to green and back to green and back to green, what you can do is head off the problem at the root and put some kind of soil acidifier on there. And there's lots of those too, soil sulfur. You got to bury it in a little bit. Um, dispersol, which you can sprinkle on top and water it in. Gypsum even helps a lot. Uh, there's also a liquid called alkaliche. All those would be good to fix the problem more permanently because then what you do is you make the soil more acetic like these trees are evolved to deal with and then all of a sudden the iron that's already in the soil becomes available. So either way, but you, you have to fix that problem because they do not make fruit the same, citrus or these plums or anything. If it's suffering with lack of iron that bad, it's not going to produce fruit very well. So little trick. Strawberries. Strawberries are uh, very productive here. I also sold strawberries at farmers markets for a lot of years. I grew them in pots. So it, it, the beauty of growing them in a pot, there's a, underneath that giant strawberry plant is a five gallon pot. 
all the fruit hang over the edge. So none of them hit the dirt where, because if you ever grown strawberries, the second they touch the ground, bugs and mold get them. So they're hanging out in the air where bugs and mold can't get them. Uh, easy to pick. They're wonderful. They love, I grow them in a pot also because they love potting soil. They hate our alkaline soil in the ground. Turns them yellow like that plum was. So if you can do them in pots, wonderful. Here's the trick that most people uh, don't know. And our season is exactly the opposite of anywhere else you're used to growing them in. So you buy the plants right now, it'd be a perfect time. Maybe a couple of weeks ago would have been even better. You buy plants as early as you can in the fall when the nights just barely start cooling off and you grow them all through the winter and you start getting fruit sometimes as early as February, March. And then that fruit comes and comes and comes all the way until it gets like burning hot july maybe so that most people go out and they buy plants in may like you would in some other climates and next thing you know they're dead because it's too hot so if you've had that don't give up on strawberries just switch it up and start them early in the fall and you'll have wonderful luck with strawberries here any variety really but the um yeah ever bearing and june bearing both seem to do really good like that so just try some and uh try it during the right time of year and you'll have tons of success there's, that was just for pride's sake. <laughs> I grew that. <laughs> uh, so the grapes also do well. And I am close to wrapping this up. Last couple of minutes, grapes, and, and because we're talking about edible landscape, we've talked about um, trees and shrubs and palms even and cactus. And here's a vine. So a vine also can be um, utilized in arbors and, you know, entryways and to cover a fence and to cover a trellis and whatever. So it's a very uh, useful type of plant in the landscape and very productive here. Grapes grow wonderfully here. Here's another one I would put. I've lost a few trying to plant them in too close to summer, but they grow wonderfully through the summer, but they have to be deeply rooted when the heat comes. So plant them now. Go, if you want grapes, get them now, plant them now. And all winter and all spring, they'll do more and more rooting deeply. And by the time the summer comes, it won't hurt them at all. It's just if you try to plant them too close to the heat, they don't have time to deeply root and you could lose them. But very productive here. There's some grape flowers if you've never seen them. There's some little tiny grapes and they're seedless grapes. And I want to uh, advise you, whatever. <laughs> I want to tell you that do not worry at all if your seedless grapes that are homegrown are only about the size of a marble or even maybe a pea. Um, that's the way they are without spraying them with hormone like they do in, in field production. So seedless grapes in the store that are as big as a quarter are always, they have to be sprayed with hormone to puff them up. Um, so don't worry if yours are small. I mean, it doesn't bother me at all. It's either, it's either, three big grapes or 20 little ones, what's the difference when you throw the whole thing in your mouth and chew it up anyway, you know? So there are lots of grapes, but they're gonna be smaller and that's okay. If you buy grapes with seeds in them, they get full size, they get bigger. But uh, most of the most popular varieties are seedless. Flame is the red one and Thompson seedless is a very good variety that's green and seedless climate. So artichokes uh, is a, a plant that lives at least a couple years usually when I plant one and they get huge three feet by three feet beautiful foliage big old artichoke you get one giant one in the middle and once a year once a season they bloom one the bloom comes out the middle and the artichokes are like the flower buds you know and you cut them before they actually open up if you don't cut them they open up into a beautiful blue flower uh, but you get one giant one in the middle maybe five, six good size ones like you get in the store around that. Under that, you get like 15, 20 real small ones. All are edible and all are um, wonderful to have out in the yard. And even if you never did anything with it, but grow it, what a beautiful landscape plant. What mine usually do is they grow beautifully all through the cold weather. And then when it gets real hot, the leaves burn, off. they die. The leaves die. The plant does not. So the leaves die in the summer, it goes dormant for the summer, and, um, and then they come back in the fall. So it's a wonderful landscape plant and uh, big, beautiful leaves like that. And this is just herbs in general, and that is that is less of it. All kinds of perennial herbs or annual herbs are wonderful landscape plants. You know, perennial, there's that bay leaf again, making a real nice dark green, evergreen little bush tree, mint, um, oregano, you know, all the perennial ones like sage, oregano, 
uh, rosemary. Rosemary is actually, you see it all over streetscapes everywhere because it's such a hardy plant, even in the full sun here. Um, some of them need shade, some don't, uh, but use them, utilize them to fill the gaps. You know, there's uh, endless choices of perennial herbs that you can use. And annual herbs would be the stuff like cilantro and dill and things like that. Almost all of them are winter crops here. And if you try to plant them when it's too hot, they'll go to seed. You won't get much out of them. But try those too if you have a garden bed. You know, if you have a garden bed, try annual herbs like that. But the perennial to live forever as a little bush or ground cover, try all those to fill the gaps in this edible landscape. And that's as much as I got to spit out at you. A little long, but I wanted to have time for lots of questions. So, oh, uh, so questions. Andrew, you got some, I see two in the chat. I can open that up. Let me get off here, I guess. Stop share. Thanks, Jonathan. That was, uh, that was great. I learned, I learned a lot. That was really awesome. Uh, the, the questions are just the ones I put in there to ask if anybody had any. Since we're a small group, oh. if any of you had um, any questions, you can feel free to unmute or you can, you can go ahead and type it in there. Um, I, I had a question to kind of get us started, I guess, um, what, um, I guess how much impact, like us noticing all the different variety of the, the trees and everything, how much impact does the, um, soil type have on what you can grow in a certain oh. area? For instance, yeah. like when you're talking about avocados, they, they kind of like the well-drained soil, right? Is that, how much yeah. have you found that that's actually a big impact or does it seem to affect Plants yeah, there. yeah, very good question. Because I know a lot of people are are maybe you know here for, that live in uh, um, Estrella Park or Verado, which is a whole different game than I'm used to. I live in the valley, so it's flat silt, you know, sedimentary soil that from all these rivers dumping it for millions of years. It's mm -hmm. flat, it's clay, it's sand, it's sandy loam, clay loam, and really good soil for anything. Really, it drains good enough for the things that need drainage, and it holds enough water for the things that don't but don't worry if you live in a hilly desert environment um uh, usually the case is on some of the it, so again i would stick with the ones i said were desert adapted those are the one mesquites would love that you know and so would uh um the, all the cactus ones and things that are more desert adapted even citrus are, are pretty adapted to our climate and our soil so the more you get into tropicals or temperate fruit cold climate fruit, you're going to have to amend the soil. You have to dig a bigger hole width wise, not deep, bigger, wider hole and backfill it with as much like compost black type soil as you can. Maybe even bring in some clay type soil from like down in the valley, um, things like that to hold water longer because that gravelly sandy soil that you find in a lot of yards in the hilly areas on the edges of town they just don't hold enough water the water goes right through them so you can just you can decide this if you in your backyard if you can throw a hose on the ground and it just disappears into the gravel or sand you're going to have a bigger problem keeping things hydrated wet you know so watering is going to be your issue i don't think that as much the minerals in the soil and all that are as big of a problem it, the main problem with really gravelly sandy soil is just trying to keep it wet for long enough for the plant to even get any of it you know so you have to have high flow of water where it spreads out real good and you have to water more frequently because it just goes right through it and it evaporates out of it just as fast so manage the water well but it might help to um, amend the soil when you plant these things that are not desert adapted. Like I say, if it was me, I'd stick with things that are more desert adapted. They're all my favorites, even down here in the valley. They're all my favorite plants are the ones that are desert adapted anyway, because they're so much easier to take care of. Right. You know, they, they don't need all the babying that ones that are from different climate. If it comes from a tropical rainforest or a temperate forest, it's not adapted to our climate. I mean, they work here with our babying, you know, but I like that first section, I, the subtropical section, it's like everything in it is, is stuff that would work better uh, with a little more challenges of maybe that gravel and soil or all that. So uh, anything would appreciate a little amendment, probably even a citrus, if it is real gravelly sandy soil. You can also put mulch on top of the soil that eventually works its way in. You know, you, if you buy raw material like wood chips, you want to put it on top. You don't want to dig it underground. So um, you leave it on top. But as the time goes by, you know, if for one, it, it makes a layer that the water can't evaporate through, right? So that's a good thing. If you make a berm, like a well, a berm around the bottom of the tree, 
that you can flood with water and get it down. And I do it with the hose because it's hard to, with drip system, it's hard to flood a well, you know, unless you have bubblers. But with drip emitters, it's almost impossible. So I would, if you really want to baby a tree up in the hills, I would dig a, you know, big a hole as I can, add some compost at least to that soil, if not some clay, build a big border around the tree. And remember that border should be as big around as the tree's head is. Well, that tree's head gets bigger and bigger. So make it where you can adapt that and spread that out as the tree gets bigger. Uh, you know, all you need is really six inches of a berm height wise, because you don't just fill it up and let it drain and stop. You fill it up and you turn the hose down slow. So it keeps it full for an hour or so. So that's the way you'd water it. And then I would put a layer, maybe a three inch layer of wood chips on top of that inside the well, they would hold that water in for longer. And that, that wood chips is going to go away with time. But that's a good thing because wh where it goes is down into that soil as it decomposes. Um, so th that's, the, if I was going to baby something not desert adapted up there in the um, more deserty soil, then I would, that's the, that's all the ways I would do it. Nice. Nice. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Does anybody what? else out there have any? Don't be shy. <laughs> I can't be that good at explaining everything <laughs> that no one has. <laughs> I don't even believe that. <laughs> well, one thing I, nobody's asked it, but I don't know if, if people were thinking about is um, any, any kind of quick tips that if for people who say I was thinking of doing a veggie garden do you recommend mm -hmm. doing a, a raised bed with just total amended soil or I uh, you know the only benefit to a raised bed in my opinion is you can sit on the side of it for comfort for human comfort <laughs> if you're just worried about plant the way the Native Americans grew vegetables here and this valley was full of crops way before you know European settlers ever came here and the way they did it was in basins. And it's the way in the desert where our air is super dry, we never have a problem with too much water, like in other climates. You know, you want to, a raised bed helps if it rains so much that it could be too much water for your garden. And that never happens here. <laughs> so what we want to do here is store water, hold water, and you want to be able to fill something up and let it drain. So what I do is uh, you start with a square and you dig it all up, fluff it up. And you can add all your amendments in there. Or, but well, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd fluff it all up. Before I add my amendments, I take some of that dirt and make a berm. A, again, it's like a six inch berm. It's the same thing as I was talking about putting around that tree, but you do it around your garden bed. Doesn't matter if it's a square, a rectangle, or a heart, or whatever. You make your bed out of that berm. And then the soil that's in the middle, you fluff it up again with amendments. And, and vegetables do need a lot of amendments. They take a they feed real heavy. And so you'd be putting like bone meal, blood meal, cottonseed meal, whatever ones you want in there. And you dig all those in, um, maybe a little gypsum too for uh, helps with real alkaline soil. And then you dig all that up good. And then you, with that fluffy, nice amended soil, you start planting stuff. And the way you water it is you fill it up like a, like a pool. You fill it up and let it drain in. And in the case of vegetables, I would just fill it up once and let it soak in, not leave it running for an hour or two like I would on a tree. Because vegetable root systems are only six inches a foot deep where a tree root system is three feet deep. So yeah, right. that part's a little different, but I do the same thing. And that's the way, I mean, it was thousands of years that worked great for a whole civilization of um, people before we came here. So I just copy <laughs> copy what what's proven you know yeah uh, but like i say raised beds are pretty and they're easy they're convenient you know it raises it up a little bit if you have trouble bending over or working on your hands and knees you know things like that there's a place for raised beds for sure and they can work um, but raised beds if you're going to use them i would leave some room whatever you make the raised bed out of leave a little bit of room at the top where you can still flood them and let them drain flood them and let them drain it's the best way to water a vegetable garden here is that flood not uh i mean you can soaker hose is the, probably the next best thing run soaker hose line all through the whole top of the bed would would it work, would work also it's all possible you know but in my opinion the best luck i've ever had with gardening here is that that basin method yes yeah fantastic 
That was a uh, really great info. I don't see any other questions or anything. So okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and wrap it up today. But uh, if any of you think of questions after, you can always uh, send Jonathan an email. His email is in the chat, or you can just reply okay. to me, and I can also forward your question to Jonathan. So um, yeah, so thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, this will be available online afterward as well. I think I'm definitely going to reference it as <laughs> a lot of the other a lot of the things is a lot to remember, so but it's really great stuff. So, um, so thank you very much, Jonathan. Everybody else, um, thank you for attending tonight, and hope you have a great evening.